Welcome. In this video, Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, the Vice Director, Atlantic Division of ARRL, and former FCC Special Counsel overseeing amateur radio enforcement, shares his personal insights into some recent issues facing the ARRL and amateur radio. I was at the Walmart uh, not too long ago, and I had to come out and backed out of my parking lot, and I was waiting for somebody to turn in and take that space so I could go out that lane. And uh, they stopped and got out of the car and said, that's my space, I saw it, I'm parking there. I said, I just came out of Walmart, I don't need to go back in, I'm kind of saving it for you, I'm trying to let you in there. But they just assume, um, assume insults. And the second thing is, conspiracy theories abound against everything. And uh, how many of you are, are league members? That's a good proportion. But you, then you know about the um, internet traffic that was critical of the league and what some things that they were going to consider at the board meeting in January. And um, there were seven or 800 uh, people involved in this email campaign. And according to that email campaign, the league was in the conspiracy to take over amateur radio and, and uh, uh, everything, everything you can imagine, bad. Reading uh, Radio Club, Reading, Pennsylvania, asked me for my take on this whole thing with the league dispute, and uh, I'm just going to read you what I wrote them to save some time. Uh, there was a, a motion that was uh, pending to let officers have a vote. They, WRL officers, first vice president, and so forth, have a vote. Well, I got contorted into some conspiracy by the league management to be able to outvote the board of directors. It was just amazing. And all it was was Mike Lysenko, uh, who is a director up in the New York area, wants to be an officer of the league. He doesn't want to continue being a director, but he wants to have a vote. That's all it was. And so he had that motion as a proposed motion at the meeting, but it generated so much hate mail that it was resolved in 15 seconds. And when we got to his motion, he just stood up and said, this motion got out of hand. It's not what I intended, so I just withdraw. And so that issue was gone in 15 seconds. After hours and hours and hours of hate mail and conspiracy theories, uh, it was gone. That's all there was to it. Um, let me just read you what I wrote the Reading Club, if you don't mind. Um, Thanks to the internet and conspiracy theorists and mass emailings, this became a conspiracy to water down the votes of elected directors and take over the entire ARRL. And that was not even close. Uh, when we were at the meeting in January and got to the proposed motion, Lysenko merely said that what he intended had gotten out of hand and he just withdrew it. That took 30 seconds and we went to the next uh, issue. Then there was a lot of discussion on the code of conduct. Now, all organizations need to be looking at their code of conduct in light of the Me Too movement. And so that's what the League is doing. They've had a code of conduct, but it hasn't been looked at in 20 years. But this got distorted into, because they're looking at the code of conduct and they're looking at Norton Censor, somebody characterized this as a, as a, it would be a gag order against the directors and, and vice directors. Now, I don't know where, where that came from. None of us would, would tolerate a gag order anyway. Um, the code of conduct hasn't been reviewed in 20 years. I don't know of any other motives to review it, but it's still under review by the executive committee. And uh, in my opinion, they should come up with an updated code of conduct if they need to that works reasonably well for an uh, organization like the League, vote it in and be done with it and move on to other things. Uh, they don't need to uh, engage in analysis paralysis, and, and they don't need to generate this this uh, series of hate mail on the internet. Now, the commission doesn't expect all league members to agree. Uh, not all members of the American Medical Association agree, and not all members of the American Bar Association. But this uh, conspiracy theory and this, this these rounds and rounds of hate mail got uh, all over the FCC Enforcement Bureau and other parts of the FCC. And, uh, you know, we've cut back the field offices. All agencies now are looking for excuses not to do things. The FCC's not gonna deal with individual amateurs. 
because of what I've just said, the hate mail and so forth. They're used to dealing with businesses and attorneys and presidents of companies and so forth. And uh, if the league is weakened uh, or is perceived as being weak, then they will at least our uh, our best uh, exercise some benign neglect to us, and at worst deregulate it. De deregulate it. So that's the warning letter I'm sounding, or the warning uh, note that I want to sound. So I think the league needs to do a better job of explaining what it was trying to do uh, in these uh, motions and actions. But uh, we just can't. Th this is a time that we've got to stick together because we we just can't have the the FCC perceive the league as weak, then it will have an excuse to ignore us. Um, one, this uh, latest issue of QSD, how many of you got May QSD already? Yeah. <clears throat> That's probably one of the most important issues we'll ever get, and for, for this reason. The first, uh, there are pages in there, two articles, one by uh, Barry Shelley and one by Rick Lindquist, explain the perspective on the amateur technician expansion. Um, and the letters to the editor, one of them uh, complains about the uh, behavior on 7200 and 3822, <clears throat> which is about really all the major enforcement problem that we have these days except for California and the WARFA net and uh, W6WBJ, but the Justice Department has that. And then this is what concerns me, and it's so heartening to um, see this group because your demographics look great compared to most of the groups I see. And I'm worried about the demographics, and that's one reason uh, I think this uh, expansion of the technician would be a good thing because young people today, as, as you're, I'm sure you will agree, they learn different than we do. <coughs> um, if I get a chance to read the paper, I want to have it in hand in front of me. I want to take it wherever I want to go. I can't stand reading the newspaper on the internet. But these kids today learn differently and I, I'm in the mentor program for Adams County and have been for a long time. And the most amazing kid I ever had was a Latino kid that lived in a double wide with 12 other people, two Dobermans and two babies. And uh, I think he had more sense than anybody in the whole compound. But he's a very smart kid. I just loved that kid. He had good grades. Uh, lots of initiative. He changed the transmission in his car by himself. He'd never done it before, but he needed to do it, so he figured out how to do it, and he did it. Very polite kid. I was trying to get him into the amateur radio service, and when he sees the question pool for the technician license, he freezes. He just can't make that leap. <clears throat> On the other hand, he can straighten out a computer, and he can tell you all about an iPhone which uh, it doesn't, is it just me or is anybody in here really taken aback by the fact that something with the computer power of an iPhone doesn't have an instruction manual with it? <laughs> that just blows me away. And when I was in the Verizon store and asked about that, they looked at me like I was from another planet. <laughs> Yet all our amateur radio gear has instruction manuals and and now you about have to keep them out beside the unit, but in the older days you read the manual and put it up and hoped that you could find it when you went to sell the unit. But they learn differently, logically and intuitively. And I don't know how it is, but I know that uh, I get my daughter to straighten out my computer when I need to. And uh, Brandon took my iPhone and was, was explaining all about it, and he doesn't even have one. He doesn't have an iPhone. <laughs> I finally figured out, too, that if, if they did make an instruction manual for it, it would weigh probably eight pounds. It does so much, and nobody likes to read anymore past the second paragraph. So they probably figured they're just wasting their money anyway. But it's designed so that it can be figured out. And a lot of our amateur equipment, like the, uh, I'll take the latest one out, the ICOM 7300, a lot of that is intuitive. It has two manuals, a simple one and a more complicated one. But you can really have a great time with that without even spending much time at all in the manual. It's just so intuitive. And the rigs today, you can't really make mistakes like you could in the old days. You know, if, it, if you're out of band, they'll beep. And if you get out of band, nobody's going to talk to you anyway. 
but you can't burn them up, you can't make them smoke, which to me is kind of a disappointment. <laughs> and I always remember uh, how much my dad hated the Viking Valiant that I had. And if, I don't know if any of you have ever operated a Viking Valiant, but they have two mercury vapor rectifier tubes in them. Are you familiar with those? <clears throat> I think some of you are. And uh, when it's under power, they, uh, they glow purple. You can send Morse code, see the Morse code in that, or it can follow your voice. And my dad wouldn't come near that thing and always said I was going to burn down the house. And I told him once that it was supposed to do that. And he said, look, son, I was in the Navy. I was a Navy diver. I was at Pearl Harbor. I've been around the world. Nothing electrical is supposed to glow purple. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it. And it says, you're going to burn down the damn house. <laughs> I always thought I would do that. And of course, the lights would dim when you send code, but that was part of the fun of it, too. But uh, one thing that uh, I want to point out in this QST is look at the silent key page. Oh. Now, in the next issue, are they going to go to a second page? I don't think they ever have, but man, they got they got room for one more down here, <clears throat> and they'll have to do away with the footnotes or go to a second page. Now, the demographics is what concerns me, and I haven't seen a great improvement in the demographics. This club is a delight because you have more young people or younger people in here than I've seen in a long time, and, and I can't imagine the work that takes because, you know, a lot of us... We just want to enjoy amateur radio. You don't want to have to be worried about club meetings, treasury reports, teaching classes. You just want to enjoy amateur radio. But we know deep down that uh, <clears throat> if we ever put down on a job application or a resume that we had an amateur license, uh, we know the deal we made with the devil. You just can't rest. You've got to pay it back. I think that's the way all of us feel. You just have to pay it back. And I I want to pay back what Joe Galt, uh, one of my elders, gave me. He's 94. He's still alive, by the way. We have a CW schedule every Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, what his cohorts gave me. And we stand on the shoulders of a lot of wonderful people that took time out uh, to help us. Now, in today's time, today's era, there's never enough time in the day. All the labor-saving devices just means we work more. And we don't work 40 hours a week. We work much more than that. <clears throat> it's just the way times are now. And it's extremely hard to have a good club and to teach classes and, and also to follow these people along after they get the license. So many people are getting a technician license and they're losing interest after uh, six months or a year. They lose interest in repeaters, or maybe they got into it just for emergency communications. And the point is, we have healthy numbers, but we want these numbers to stay with us because every year the Grim Reaper takes out a wider swath of amateur radio operators. So we've got to think about the future and however we can get these people in. You would think that after um, uh, 10 years of enforcement, uh, I would say, no, we need to make the exam harder. <coughs> Excuse me, a little horse tonight. No, we need to have uh, make it really hard to, to get into the amateur service. But I noticed that in after uh, 3,000, I don't know the number here, 200-something enforcement situations, there was never a problem uh, or a difficult problem with somebody who had lack of knowledge. Uh, if, if a technician or somebody that just got a license uh, screwed up, it was always unintentional on a phone conversation would do it. The enforcement problems, the hardcore enforcement problems, and Laura agrees with this to this day, Laura Smith, by the way, for those of you who don't know, she uh, is my successor at SEC, agrees with this. The enforcement problems are mental, and it have, doesn't have anything to do with an exam, and 90% of my most severe enforcement problems were amateur and extra. Wow. <coughs> And uh, when I first got the uh, enforcement job, the first week I went down to D.C. to talk to, to Bill Cross at the Policy and Rules Division, and we made a deal. I said, we'll stay out of policy, but you guys have got to stay out of enforcement because you can't, you can't have that intermingling. And I said, but I want to tell you one thing. I hear that you're thinking about deleting the code requirement. 
And I said, I'm, my opinion is if you do that, you'll remove a filter and it's going to really degrade amateur radio because that to go through the code, you show you're serious to get an amateur license. And without even blinking, and I never forgot this, he said, well, if that's what you think, you go back and let's talk six months from now after you've had a chance to review your most severe enforcement issues nationwide <laughs> and you tell me what class of license they are. So I uh, thought about that and after six months I saw that 99% of my most severe enforcement problems, they had passed a code test at one time. So it isn't a filter, but we're ingrained to think that because we had to do it. And I don't know why it isn't, but it, it, it suddenly became clear to, well, it became clear to me over years that enforcement issues are conduct and they're mental. Uh, the people that would make a mistake would usually be, they'd usually be very minor mistakes, and if they were serious enough to call them about it, they immediately corrected it and they practically had a heart attack because they had heard from the FCC in the first place. The mental ones, the most severe enforcement problems, were amateurs who thought they knew everything, they didn't like anything new, didn't like new people, uh, they were contrarians, and they just wanted to screw things up for everybody else. And uh, there's several of them went to jail. We have enormous fines out there. There's a couple of more enormous fines uh, coming out. And I just can't imagine how you have all this equipment that you spent thousands of dollars for and, and presumably you enjoy amateur radio. How can you operate that in such a manner that you end up with a $10,000 fine? I mean, I don't, I don't understand that. But then if I understood those people, I'd probably be as crazy as they are. <laughs> so, uh, but there is no solution there. It's a very small uh, portion of our members. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they can be heard in some cases around the world. Our current chairman, although he is uh, technically a Trump appointee, he was already on the, on the commission. And he was very well liked, very well thought of. And the, the fellow that worked in the office beside me worked with uh, Pi when he was general counsel, and uh, Pi had just Pi had just become general counsel, and, and Bill said he worked with him for a couple of weeks on a big project, never knowing he was the general counsel. That's how humble he is. And when he finished, when they finished, he said, "Well, it's been good working with you. I guess we have to run it by the general counsel's office now." He said, oh, "Not really. I am the general counsel." <laughs> <laughs> That's the first Bill knew of. <laughs> and uh, I know that he's big on enforcement uh, in, the, in the congressional uh, testimony where Wheeler was being called on the carpet for cutting down the FCC and getting rid of so many engineers. Pi also testified against that. Wow. Uh, but that was a very unfortunate time. Uh, at least half of the engineers are gone. Whether they will reverse that, I don't know. And my own opinion is, from a homeland security standpoint, it's going to hit the fan one of these days. And when there's interference at an airport location and there's not a field office within 400 miles that can get there and do it, that's when it's going to hit the fan. I think it's just a matter of time. Amateur radio is, is more valuable, I think, now to the public than it ever has been. And there's one reason, and, and I think our day is going to come when this happens. Uh, I'm talking about internet warfare. And all these systems, not ours, but all of these systems depend on the internet, whether it's the power grid or anything else. And once that goes down, they have no communications. But amateur radio, we're, we're involved with the internet, we're intertwined with the internet, but probably everybody's station in here tonight, all of you that have a station, would work just fine if the internet went down. Maybe you'd be inconvenienced in logging, uh, maybe you couldn't look up something on QRZ, but you can still talk around the world with the, with the computer system down, and it's going to happen. I mean, NASA says that over 100,000 times a year, uh, they, they suffer probes from some entity trying to get into their system. Uh, and, and I used to bring newspaper articles around with me, you know, what the hackers are telling us, America's dangerous internet illusion, uh, internet roulette, how America's 911 system can be hacked. But these articles are every week now. I don't need to bring them around. Everybody knows about them. It's every week, if not every day. And it's just a matter of time where 
uh, amateurs are going to come in and save the day because they don't need the internet to communicate. And, and I'm so glad that there's still so much interest in emergency communications because I don't think that's going to change in our lifetime. And it's going to be interesting to, to see what happens. But I think amateur is more valuable today than ever before. And the states and counties are starting to realize that. Homeland Security, uh, the new uh, head of Homeland Security, is also an amateur operator, the new guy that they got. Uh, the head of the National Weather Service, I believe, is an amateur operator. But they, they know what the real situation is out there. So we can survive any given chairman or any given effort by uh, FCC political approach to uh, to uh, harm us or water us down, uh, and when I think we can survive budget problems if we all stick together and if we continually recruit, we've got to get new people. Uh, this is the longest silent key section I've ever seen, and it has always bothered me going around to amateur events what our demographics look like, and uh, I haven't seen. I don't know if I've ever seen clubs that had this many younger people in here. A lot of times it looks like I'm talking to a retirement home. And I'm part of that. I mean, I'll, you, you, you told people how long I've been licensed. Thanks. You didn't tell them I got my license at three. But anyway, <laughs> we've got to change that because young people are fascinated with amateur radio when they see it demonstrated, especially and this, I never would have expected this, but especially CW. And I guess because they're getting bored with, uh, with text messaging, uh, Voxer, or WhatsApp. But uh, I noticed the times that I demonstrated it for a, for a church youth group. Once somebody said, will you bring in a key here and show these people what, what Morse code is? And uh, they were, they were uh, absolutely mystified at it. They loved it. It's a secret language. It's something that they can do that their peers can't. And in, in looking through the ads and uh, hi, looking through the ads in QST, you'll be amazed if you pay attention to it. The number of keys and keyers that are for sale. Uh, it's not only Bengali. It's uh, or Bengali. It's N3ZN is a, is a key maker. And I. Uh, there's a lady and her husband that go around to the ham fest. I can't think of who who they are, but they always have a big section of different keys. They might be the people that bought Vibroplex. I, think uh, they I see her everywhere. And uh, I haven't seen her in a couple of years, but she told me then that business was better than ever. So it could be that eliminating the code requirement, uh, having to learn the Morse code, it could be that that was like having a book put on the required reading list in high school. It just, <laughs> it just ruined it. And later on, when you're 50 or 60, you're thinking, and I should have read that book. I'm going to find that book and read it. And, and I've, I've read so many books in the last 10 or 20 years that probably were on the required reading list in high school. I didn't get anything out of it. So uh, they love the code. And of course, with this, uh, and I don't understand how it works, this strawberry pie, whatever it is. Uh, raspberry pie. Raspberry pie. Yeah, that, that shows what I know about it. <laughs> or, 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 you know, I'm hungry. I guess maybe I'm thinking that. Uh, they love that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they can learn it, and, and they grew up in the digital age. So that's going to be a great uh, recruitment thing for us. Now, if we can make the technician uh, exam, technician privileges more interesting, and the reason I think we need to do that personally is when you really look at the technician privileges and consider the fact that we're still, still in the bottom of the solar cycle, they don't really have that much privileges. Uh, the, the HF privileges aren't really helping them with the way the solar cycle is. And I just read, I think, uh, I don't know if it was in this article or not, but uh, we've had hardly any uh, solar storms, and, and they don't really know when the cycle's going to end, the, the bottom of it. And, uh, you know, 10 years ago, when, uh, when they had those privileges, they could have done a lot more with them than they can today. And today, DX seems to be very sporadic. And, of course, if there's contest, uh, it's out there. but. I noticed that in the last contest, 10 meters was really active, and I started to wonder, maybe maybe there's nothing wrong with 10 meters. Maybe we just tune around and don't hear anybody and say, oh, this is dead, and we go to 20 meters. Maybe somebody on there would call us CQ, they'd give some answers that maybe that everybody's listening and nobody's sending anything. I don't know. But anyway, with the, with the sunspot cycle, 
we need to give them more, I think. And, and uh, of course, there's some digital groups that think that it's an attempt to take over uh, the digital area with WinLink and all that stuff. I don't even, I've never even seen WinLink demonstrated. Uh, that, that's not what the issue is. The issue is to get people in and retain them. And one thing, and I'm going to talk to the VEC committee about this, but the question pool for technician is well over 350 questions. Uh, they have to have spare questions in there in case some are disqualified or something, but it's, it's uh, very intimidating. And I didn't bring it tonight, but looking in my uh, league manuals for licenses in the 70s, looking at the advanced class license, uh, all the license classes were covered in, in a very thin manual with the questions in there. And uh, I know times have changed, and, and by commission rule, they have to have 10 questions, in a, uh, 10 questions in the pool for every question that's on the exam. But I think at least for the entry level, that needs to change. Uh, because I, I don't feel threatened at all by young people coming in the amateur service uh, and having to answer a lot easier questions than on a technician exam. And I think if anybody's going to feel threatened by it, uh, it would be me since I spent 10 years in, in enforcement. You would think I'd be jaded and I'd want to keep these people out. But I'd love to see them get in amateur radio by droves and let them let them learn and discover what a roofing filter is and what uh, digital filter is, filtering is and all this. Let them learn as they as they do it because that's the way they learn. And uh, it's a different mindset and we've got to understand that, that they learn differently. They grew up in a different age and they don't need big, thick instruction manuals. And they're smart. They're really smart. So I'll just open it up to a discussion and question. That's, that's where I'm coming from. We meet again and the board meets, speaking as a director for, uh, vice director for a second. They meet again in July. And uh, Saturday, this Saturday, the uh, executive committee meets to uh, talk more about this code of conduct. And I hope they'll just pass something and get on with it and get on with other things. Uh, it just causes the only thing left that can cause a big uproar, and we just, we just don't need it. A while ago, I heard that there was a movement put somewhere, I don't know whether it was Congress or where, to allow states and localities to enforce FCC rules and regulations. Um, I assume that's no longer active. I just like to know what, as a lawyer, what your opinion is on. That. Yeah, I haven't heard that that crops up every once in a while, but I think it would be a disaster because you take the uh, the townships supposedly um, regulate cable TV, but they can't. It's too complicated. You know, there's. Uh, Cumberland Township has uh, Comcast. They can't regulate that. It's too complicated. Communications is the same way. The state and localities have budget problems. And uh, communications is, goes around the world, across the states. I don't think it, was, it, it would work. And I don't hear that anymore. Once in a while, that'll crop up. But I don't think that would work, in my opinion. Um, I know it's come up before, I think both as a, maybe a petition to the commission as well as I think there have been a number of things put through Congress to deal with the uh, issue that a lot of amateurs live in covenant restricted mm -hmm. areas that they can't put up antennas. But this is one of those really prime areas around here that that's the case. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing one time they said the, the commission's answer was, we don't believe that we should get involved <coughs> in things that deal with private contracts because that's not our realm. But they did make a similar ruling once with um, receiving antennas, right? They said that they would take for uh, over, the air, over the air over for the receiving. Air receiving device. So I was just kind of curious, do you have any feeling why the FCC um, feels that they don't have the prerogative or there's no um, uh, precedent for well, that? Well, I think the, the OTAR, the over the air receiving devices, they were, they were heavily lobbying. There was a lot of money behind that. But the recent, uh, thinking, I'll say recent, last 10 years, is the FCC, and they, they make, uh, what, the, what the league's trying to do is get enough support in Congress that even if it doesn't get passed, that uh, they will not the Congress will notify the FCC, just pass something, pass this same thing to protect <laughs> these guys. But the FCC feels that since it's an independent regulatory agency, it shouldn't be determining 
uh, what goes on in housing developments. They think it should come from Congress. And uh, that's basically what their attitude has been uh, outside of PRB1. One thing that we're hoping to do is get enough support in Congress where the commission could get, get the word just pass, just, just like you did PRB1, make it stronger and take care of it so it doesn't have to go to a vote in Congress. And I, th I think that still could happen, but I don't know the status to this day, or to this week, I should say, on it. Uh, Chris Emily would, would know that. There apparently was a lot of criticism of the version that was floating around Congress. Uh, that got an incredible amount of uh, criticism because it looked like that the uh, local jurisdiction could uh, <coughs> make amateur uh, antennas uh, the type of antenna you could have so minimal as to be useless. I think that's what they're afraid of. So uh, that's going to be looked at, or is being looked at too, again, and I don't know really what the status of it is. But it was just a thought in the FCC that we shouldn't be regulating housing. If somebody wants to live in an antenna-free neighborhood, we shouldn't be the ones to tell them not to. And uh, the person that felt most strongly about that is gone, and maybe that'll, maybe that'll change now. Um, is the division planning to do anything about the uh, mutual assistance team con concept with the radio emergency service and getting some real training out into the field where we can you know, develop standards and live up to them? With, with which emergency service? With the radio emergency oh, okay. service and the mutual assistance team context. context. We we're supposed to be setting up Many years ago, mutual assistance teams mm -hmm. that jumped from one division to a division in trouble uh, to help them out. But, you know, it, we had a lot of fanfare at the time, but I haven't seen much since. I don't know the answer to that. I know there's a committee that is working on all that, trying to blend it all in, but I don't know the status of it. I can find out for you. If you'll, you wouldn't mind just sending me an email with that question, I'll get an answer to you from the horse's mouth. And I'll know more about it. Uh, if, yeah, if you can send it to me the next day or two, I can find out more about it Saturday because I'm going to be in a conference call with the with the executive committee. But wasn't there some discussion back about baud rates and bit rate data error rates? They were trying to raise the change that rate regulation so they could change, go higher data rates. Or yeah, because our baud rate regulation is uh, 20 years old. We have the slowest yeah. baud rate in the world. And <clears throat> the league wants to get that raised. Uh, so there again, the conspiracy theorists think that it's uh, some effort just to uh, to have digital takeover. But the fact is, our baud rate is ancient, and just needs to be. All they want to do is update it. So it's still stuck in sort of right now. It is. But I, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be long with all the emphasis on digital now. In the back, thank you. Did the discussion around talking about the popularity of this FT8, why it took off, and it's been a phenomenal mode? It has been. amount of interest, and, and so, it's the propagation, it's good for because of low propagation time, or just, you know, it's Yeah, just uh, somebody told me the other day that there's over a million uh, FT8 QSOs logged on Logbook of the World now. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't used it. Uh, for me with PSK-31, of course, but I haven't done the FT8. Oh, PSK-31 is just dropped, gone away. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah. Yeah, but this FT8, and apparently after you hit the button, you don't even have to be there for the thing to finish and log it. I mean, I don't know. That's, I'm old school, so don't ask me what I think of that. <laughs> <coughs> you, know, you have to come back to do the next one. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> I have to see where that's going. But I remember, um, I don't know, I, to me, that's... Uh, I just like HF, I'm old school, but I remember when single sideband, when the Halicrafters HD 37 came out and got very popular, there were people who were saying that will ruin amateur radio, it doesn't even have a carrier. What kind of radio <laughs> signal is that? And I'm sure that uh, when uh, Boyce was invented, the, um, the uh, spark gappers thought that'd be the end of amateur radio. It's all in a matter of perspective, but it, it, there's an awful lot of FT8 fans out there, and you just hear about it all the time. We've read some articles about uh, receiver immunity standards, where the FCC or somebody is saying that 
to expect a noise-free noise floor is really not proper. You guys need to be starting to design systems to be tolerant to noise. And I'm just wondering where do we think that noise level is going to be? You know, is an S7 noise level going to be the new norm? Well, that's the danger of it, and that's why the league wants the FCC to revisit that. Right. I don't want somebody saying, well, S you should tolerate an S7 and then not worry about it because you can't have a, a, a pure spectrum anymore. I don't, I don't want that. And I think with uh, the sensitivity of some of these systems, they won't be able to do that. They'll have to do a better job than that. And I, I hope it's uh, not somebody just trying to get out from under. Uh, you know, there's an awful lot of RF junk out there because the FCC has been behind the curve on that for years and they approve this stuff. And I don't know if anybody on a routine basis goes out and buys one off the shelf and tests it. Seems like it's the league that does that. The FCC just depends on self-regulation, but it's a lot of junk out there. When you were enforcement director, what was your most memorable enforcement case? Well, <coughs> or is there one, or is there I'm ten? Just, or? It's <laughs> nine o'clock. <laughs> I'm just here. I'll tell you one that's always it still bothers me to this day. Um, when I got the enforcement job, I had an amateur station, but I didn't make probably more than 12, 15 contacts a year. Kept up with it, kept it running, and I always liked to fiddle with it and have good antennas and so forth. So when I got the job, I started listening around on the bands, and I was appalled at what I heard on 75 meters, for example. I said, this is CB, this is not amateur radio. So, <laughs> These complaints, uh, these situations would make me mad. I can't tell you how many weekends were ruined because of some jerk I was listening to. I'd go home and I'd do the listening. But on, I found that in some cases, uh, a surprising number, if you could call them and talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the problem would go away. I was surprised at how, how, many, how many times that happened. And so one Friday afternoon, I was looking at this case down in Georgia and I was just getting furious with it. And I'm thinking, I'm not waiting all weekend to work on this. I'm just going to make a call. So I called down to the man's house. I don't remember the call sign. It's in my notes somewhere. And his wife answered the phone. And I told her who it was and said, uh, I'd like to speak to the amateur radio operator in the house. And she said, well, that's uh, so-and-so. My husband, he doesn't get home till 6. Uh, what's this about? And I said, well, I'd rather talk to him. And she said, no, go ahead and tell me what it's about. And uh, I'll set it up so you can talk to her. So I told her it was about the typical thing that you were hearing on 75 meters in those days, the arguments, the deliberate interference, the, the language, and so forth, the fights. And so I explained to her what was going on. And there was a moment of silence. And then she said, well, as I said, he gets home at 6, and I can guarantee you after 6.15 tonight, you will never have this problem again. <laughs> we never heard from him again. <laughs> never got any complaints about it. <laughs> Just went away. I don't know if he's buried in the backyard or what. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know what happened to him. Probably his equipment was in a dumpster somewhere. <laughs> but in, in the ensuing months, I'm thinking, I wonder what did happen, because it wasn't that bad. I <laughs> to him. Maybe I'll call down there, and I said, no, I'm going to let enforcement take its course. I'm not touching it. So uh, we never heard anything more from him, about him, no complaints or anything. So I don't know what happened. But sometimes the best enforcement tool in the world is a wife or a girlfriend standing in, at the radio room door unnoticed, hearing what's going on. That helps a lot of times. And you know, uh, I don't know if Laura does it, but I used to send tapes of uh, the monitoring that was the subject of the complaint. I didn't send those down there for the guy to listen to and answer, although that's what we said, you've got to answer this within 30 days. That's not the reason I sent it. I sent it because I knew there was about a 50% chance that his wife would get the mail <laughs> and say, uh, hey, what's in this package that came from the government? And uh, the guy's going to have a hard time saying, that's nothing, dear, don't worry about it. And she would probably say, they're, they're tape recordings. Well, what are they? I want to hear them. And so when she'd listen to them, you'd never hear anything more about that case. And uh, that's the only reason I ever sent the tapes. And uh, when somebody uh, 
lied about their relative having a certain call sign. You know, the standards when you get a relative's call sign. And we knew that uh, that it wasn't true. We'd get a complaint on it. And uh, I would always wait six months to even start that case because I wanted the QSL cards to have been bought, the license plate <laughs> to have been purchased, and everything else. If you do it right off the bat, it's just correct and he withdraws the application and there's no loss. But if you wait long enough, there's some penalty to be paid <laughs> if you've done all that. So a lot of enforcement is, is psychological. And um, one, one night that first year, uh, I was listening on 75 meters. Uh, there was a group and uh, one fellow, or two, both of them were in North Carolina that were causing most of the problems. But I was just sitting there listening as I did a lot. And uh, one of them identified and said, uh, this is, uh, I can't think it's a guy's call sign, it was a W-4, just said, this is uh, W-4 such and such, Riley, in case you're listening. And I said, I can't let this pass. <laughs> and I, said, I can't let this pass. I had the linear on and everything. And so I came back and said, thank you very much. We really appreciate it when you do that and gave my call sign. And you didn't hear anything on there. <laughs> you didn't hear anything for 10 minutes. And finally somebody came on and said, damn, I think even the static's gone away. <laughs> those, are, those, are, uh, those are times I remember. Those were the things that worked. <laughs> That's when I thought God must be a ham operator. <laughs> we had a lot of good luck. But uh, you see, I, I had, uh, my job was like shooting a flock of ducks. I could just fire away. I'm going to get a few of them. But the ducks that are out there now that Laura's trying to get are much smarter and they're wiser. And uh, she's gotten some characters that I never could, I never could get. And uh, they were just too slippery for me. And you'll see a case coming out. Uh, the person that she got, he was one of our informants. I was totally convinced he was on our side, but it turned out he's like the, uh, the arsonist that works for the volunteer fire department. That's exactly what he was. And when they did the monitoring and the direction finding uh, and the inspection, and they didn't find anything, so they left. But the next day, one of the engineers drove back, uh, did the monitoring, and did not inspect, but he inspected the premises and found it transmitter that was the jamming transmitter. And I couldn't believe it, but that's the way I'm a little naive sometimes. I have, I'm, I'm an optimist on, on these things. But part of it is something that we can never, part of it is, a, is the nature of society now. You can't regulate stupidity and every group has people that are going to be contrarians. You know, if they want to do A and B, you say no. Um, but you can do A, B, and C, then they don't want to do that either. And, and I was on the Township Planning Commission there in uh, at Cumberland Township, and I noticed that there were certain people, we called them caves, citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> no matter what you did, they would complain about it. They would stand up and you'd see them come into the meeting and you know that they're going to get at least 10 or 15 minutes of opposition, no matter what you were doing. And uh, I really think that if we had said we found a cure for cancer, there'd be two people standing up, you know, to say something about it. They just didn't like anything. And uh, some people are just that way. It's a sign of our times, and, and hopefully it's a pendulum that'll swing back. But you can, well, you, people uh, complain about the language on the amateur bands, but go to a shopping center or go to the beach and look at the language people are using. Uh, look at the language you see on television. That would have been a a major federal investigation 10 years ago. Uh, we're just different. It's a different society. Maybe it'll, it'll swing back. I don't know what the, what the solution is. Um, I guess if I knew, I would be head of the UN rather than being in Rockport, Maryland, talking to an amateur group. But uh, part of it is human nature, and we can't, we can't change it because we want amateur radio to be a cross-section of society. That's how we get our members. That how it, that's how it has value. So as long as it's a cross-section of society, we're going to have a certain percent. And in our area, it's absolutely minimal. And in our service, it's absolutely minimal. It's amazing with all the thousands of frequencies we have, the power 
the modes that we have, the activities from contesting to DXing, you would think the problems would be a hundred times more than they are. But most people just want to do it right if they can figure out how to do it. And at, at the end of the day, uh, most people just want to, uh, they don't want to go down that road. But that's why enforcement is, problem, is critical because for every um, enforcement case that's brought, you're going to have a couple hundred people that might be, might have been thinking about going that direction. And it's a deterrent. You have to have a deterrent. And it's like 270 out here would be if you knew there would never be a state police out there. <laughs> this human nature, you're going you're to try to. So uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. My email is my call sign. <laughs>